there's more people signed up, so they might still be filtering in for the next few minutes. Um, so before we get started, think about, we're going to have a very interactive uh, part of what we're doing after, after a while. And there'll be a chance to request de live demos of anything you want to might want to see in Canvas. So before we do that, think about what are some of the activities your students do individually that can that you think Canvas might be able to help with, like meetings or videos or like what. But what, we're not really focused on group work kind of things or in class kind of things. So you can use the back, the very back page of your handout it is blank. You can make notes on there and. I found a box of pencils up at the front desk if anybody needs one. Please do that for a couple of minutes. We'll see if more people come in and then we'll get started. And you can always come back to this. So welcome, everyone. My name is Sid Freitag. I work with Academic Technology. And welcome to today's uh, Teach Effectively in Canvas session on individual designing for individual learning in Canvas. Uh, so hopefully everyone has been added to the course and you're able to access these pages uh, in the Canvas Training Depot class. And uh, so what we'll do today, uh, one thing I want to do is after the first hour-ish is uh, to do live demos of uh, things you might want to see in Canvas. So if you've been thinking about uh, the things you've been thinking about, what your students work on individually, uh, you can click that button, which should take you to a Google page, and you can make requests there. And I'll do my best of uh, what I can demo live in the time. Uh, so help. It would be more fun if it's not just, oh, I want to see this button in Canvas. But if we also think about, I want to see that button because my students are going to do this thing, and I think this button will help the students have that thing happen. Um, so we'll do that and talk about, uh, some, talk about some ideas around individual learning, and we'll spend a lot of time critiquing examples. Because I think that people really learn by looking at examples and seeing what you like what you don't like, what could be made better, what might apply to you or not. So uh, that's the schedule. And there, we're a small enough group that we can go around and do introductions and find out who's here, what you're teaching or uh, supporting in Canvas if you're not directly teaching, and uh, anything in particular you're interested in uh, hearing about. Let's start here with Lori. Hi, I'm Lori Lopez. I'm over by 
Auditory and Communication Arts. I teach um, an intro to media studies course, but I started blending in the fall. So I don't know what specific ways I want to learn, but I do have a lot of uh, individual learning components already. So Uh, I'm from the festival and I teach Japanese here. And the reason why I wanted to come here is because, uh, first of all, I'm quite new to Canvas. I just started using it last semester. And also, uh, this semester, I'm going to work on some uh, uh, online materials. And I wanted to see how that can uh, be connected with Canvas. Okay, great. Welcome. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is I'm a Fulbright scholar from South Africa. I'm currently teaching um, ECU, beginner and intermediate. Um, I like technology. I love technology. I'm, I'm adventurous. Um, anything that makes my life easy in technology, I'm, I'm interested. So that's why I'm here to find out how else I can stay under the technology to support education. Teach uh, leadership financial services leadership symposium, and for that class, I'm looking mostly for ideas of activities to use. Um, this is mostly a guest speaker based course, and then I also support the financial life skills courses, which are a flipped classroom model for the students to get all of the information, lecture video, um, readings, articles, and assessments online prior to coming to class. So just making sure that everything is. I'm John Martin. I'm from uh, the Active Teaching Initiatives. So if you want ideas throughout the semester, pick up one of these schedules and come to our Active Teaching Labs and Active Teaching Exchanges. Um, we're having them Friday mornings, Thursday afternoons, and then 1 to 12, I'm sorry, 1 to 2, and Wednesday, every other Wednesday is from 1 to 2 as well. But lots of ideas by faculty and instructors sharing ideas of what they're doing. Hi, I'm Sarah Forsen. Um, I'm a PhD student in Canton, Italian. I'm not teaching right now, but I have a campus visit coming up for a faculty course. And uh, during my initial interview, the professor said they were nervous about the air transition. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, I better learn nice. about campus before I go to the next one. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sarah Gavick. I'm a PhD student in psychology. Um, I use Canvas a lot with my classes. I taught a course completely online last summer on Canvas. Um, I'm here to learn more ways uh, to teach effectively on Canvas to um, enhance my students. Yeah. Don? Why are you here? Why am I here? <laughs> yeah, are you here Don? Lurking. Um, I'm Don Fletchman. I actually work in academic technology with them. I am the video service lead for academic technology and we were just shooting some b-roll this morning for a little video that's being made about this this initiative tell me and I'll check you in hopefully everyone if you've been in the room uh, building before you have a uh, restroom there's a women's restroom just to the left and there's a men's restroom further down the hall and around the corner I hate to put you on the spot. Would you like to introduce yourself really quick? Oh. Start with Nora, where you are on campus? I'm um, here. So, my name is Amy Anderson, and I actually just started yesterday. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm a director over in community education for our health services, um, mental health, and substance abuse support. Okay. Great. Awesome. For the slides, uh, if you want to uh, follow along or refer back to them afterwards or embedded in this uh, video uh, and page in Canvas, but I like to use it easier for me to just work some of them on a separate screen. So today is where we are. So these are words you hear a lot on campus, active learning. Instead of 
big deal for, uh, for a few years. I mean, it's been around for a long time. It's just been talked about more lately. And when you think of active learning, you might get images in your head like this, images like this. So this is what people do in active learning. You get students talking to students, uh, faculty coming in and helping them problem solve. So it's very doing, th a lot of images of doing things in class. And that's great. That's good stuff. Uh, but what, we, what I'm trying to do with individual learning is to think about what helps get the students ready to do that in class? So have any of you been in class where you try to ask some question or activity where to get the students active and they all sit there like this? Right. Kind of embarrassing, right? I, I would be. Um, so, some of the, so the reasons for that, could, there could be a lot of reasons for that, but what we're trying to do today is think about how, we're, how can we design activities for the students to do out of class before they get to class so that when they come to class, they're, they're ready. They're, they've, at least, they've thought about something you've asked them to think about. And so if you ask a question to get some good discussion going, at least they haven't had the chance to think about it. And also, uh, would make the point that active learning isn't solely restricted. Uh, people being in class together, be having group discussions, and being talkative. This can be active learning too. Um, you can read a book passively, or you can read a book actively. So, uh, so again, these are the types of things, and how might that happen? Um, is that because uh, I one of the things I've learned uh, the more I study at teaching is that I wasn't taught to read very well. That I learned to read when I was in grade school, and then it's like go read. And it wasn't until I was really studying for these things that I realized, oh, you could be taught to read. There's a way to read in humanities. There's a way to read science and interacting with your books. I was never taught that that I can remember. So just something as simple as thinking that reading can be act more active or more passive, depending on how you, you do it and if the students just need some prompts. So active learning, I would advocate active learning can be done individually as well as in groups. So, we're going to spend a lot of our time uh, looking at examples in Canvas that I've made. They're hypothetical examples. Um, but in order to look at them and really try to pick them apart, we'll give you just a teeny little bit of learning theory, uh, just skimming the surface of learning theory, which I broke down into three, three main chunks. Um, knowledge structures and organization, knowledge progression, and using an instructional strategy. And any one of these topics could be gone into in a lot more depth, but that's not, we're not here to turn you into instructional designers. Just get some language uh, so we can talk about the examples in Canvas and how Canvas can help. So think about knowledge structures. Uh, use the cartoon. It's that difference between information and knowledge that y'all are experts in your field. You weren't always. Uh, you had to go through some process. At, at some point, you were learning the vocabulary of your discipline. You were learning how to solve problems and get uh, ideas that became more sophisticated. And then you could do more original work. And so, and now, if I were to mention something from your discipline, you could say, "Oh, this thing. It connects to that thing. It's like this other thing. It's not like that thing." So you've got deficiencies in your head, your brain, about how to process and think in your discipline that your students don't. Your students might just have bits and pieces of information, and they're still learning the information. They're learning how to put the pieces together. So there's a difference between knowledge, uh, experts and novices, and just what they know, not just what they know, but how they can think about how they know. Uh, so, question for you then, 
and as, as teachers, is how do you get students from having just a few pieces of knowledge and maybe some tentative connections to something more rich and robust? Um, so some of that is the making the connections, drawing the line between the pieces of knowledge. And at first, probably the teacher draws the line, says this goes to this. But then over time, students form them themselves. And they form, students grow these connections by engagement, by wrestling with problems, by trying things, by finding something and making meaning out of it. So again, so, original, so initially, as a te instructor, you're helping draw those lines, but eventually students get to where they are making more of them themselves. And there's a couple of there's a couple of frameworks that help think about how students are making connections. Uh, one of them, who, who knows this one? Many, several of you. Uh, it's very well known in educational. Uh, instructional language, uh, Bloom taxonomy of the cognitive domain. The basic idea is that there's foundational knowledge. When you're first learning something, maybe all you do is be able to define it or list the steps of a process. And then as you get more top solid with that, you can do things like problem solving and applying the ideas. And then as you progress more, you can be doing more original work, creating and putting things together, critiquing, comparing, contrast, finding new, new ways. But the idea is that you don't start out up at the very top, at least not in a sophisticated way, that this is part of that, uh, part of how students are building those connections, turning information into knowledge, is that they move through steps. And if anyone is really interested in this, I do have a handout that lists verbs that go with the different levels, like at the lo foundational level, it's things like define and list. Then it gets more into apply and analyze and evaluate and create. But the idea that you progress in knowledge. The other uh, framework that's really simple is about activity design. And this, this uh, model comes from a gentleman named William Horton, and it's the absorb you connect model. And it's got some overlap with what you see in Bloom, is that you start out with activities where students absorb something. They're, they're getting information. Maybe you're reading, watching a video. And then you build on that by doing something with the information, problem solving or going out finding things. And then connect is really fuzzy between, the, the boundary between do and connect is really fuzzy, but connect Usually takes you more individually, what mean more um, self-guided working, more real life. So again, the idea is that you don't just start out with a brand new thing and connecting it. You have to first learn learn ideas, and then you can apply them. And this is not just a completely linear process. That activities build on one one another. What questions? Uh, do you have on any of these, uh, this very briefly introduction to uh, instructional theory so far? of the 
sophistication in your discipline they might have and where you wanted to get to, and you think about different types of activities, how do you put them together? And I will confess, and that, that was me as an undergraduate, I knew when I went to class, and then out of class was for homework and studying for tests. And I did that 15 weeks, and then I was done, and then I could forget everything. And I got through a lot of school like that, because I could. Um, because I got through a lot of school like memorizing, that there wasn't that many opportunities where I had to think originally or apply ideas. And hopefully your students do better than this. So one model to try to make more obvious that this isn't the approach, it's that there's more you can do than this with your class, is something uh, that comes from a man named B. Fink, called a castle top activity design, where you think deliberately about what students do before class, which flows into what you do in class, which flows essentially into something you do out of class. And this can be part of your activity design flow and communicating to students that this is how it works. It's not just read the book or not read the book and then come to class and don't do anything whether you read the book or not. It's more that you need, the students need to do things out of class in order to get what they, they're going to get out in class, otherwise they're missing out.
imaging, you're, and I don't teach landscape ecology, so I'm probably not that really that good at it. But imagine that we were in class, and at the end of class, I'd say, all right, next time, next time we meet, we're going to start talking about putting ideas together about animals in the environment. And so between, and it's, it's a Tuesday, Thursday class, so between now and Thursday when you come to class, go to the Canvas website, and there's links to a uh, video and some articles, and go take a look at those, and then we'll come to class on Thursday and we'll talk about them. All right, so that was what I told you at the end of class. And so now in Canvas, if you just look at example one, Here's what, here's what I have for you in Canvas. Um, I have a link. And there's another button. But I have this video that I found. And I put it in Kaltura, which is our uh, web hosting service. And only watch a little bit of it. going viral uh, almost a year ago. These are time-lapse photos. Overnight, as your pigs, and eventually your cow falls into the hole that the badger does. And so this is cool to the scientists because they've never seen this before. Um, but so we're here, to, we're really here to see about how am I using Canvas. So I gave you a link to the video in Canvas, and here's some links to some articles. And, I'm happy, and uh, here's another link to an article. I think that was all I had. I have another link to an article. Uh, go find an article and come around it. So that is my Canvas module. Pretend you're telling that button. So for my critique question, start like, uh, what, what did you see from there? Pretending you're a student. Oh, yeah. Uh, order of what I was supposed to do was here and how my like EQL has my links are in one section maybe in articles and another oh. section videos and another section right so students just have to like hop between those but I like to have here is set up so that you have boom 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 like the little okay. unit just to get it on the little screen for it to be okay one thing Canvas is helping me do is to collect and organize the, the, the media that information that I want you to access. Okay. Yeah, Lord. Uh, so it looks like that was the videos and it's like we were looking at a little content, but there wasn't a lot of real clear like what we were supposed to get out of the video or what there was like a good to bad reviewing of it or like people who were afterwards if you're interested in the thing. Okay. Yeah, so if you were working individually, if you were working on, if you left my class and then you're in your apartment and you're watching the video, you could easily be thinking, why am I doing this? Okay. Yeah, so I could have I could have done more to give more context. Yeah, what else do you think? I think none of the more notes, none of the other topics really integrated any of the material. Um, and even the assignment where you're charging academic articles doesn't really like integrate to these other topics besides just being on the screen and being on the screen. Okay. Um, so it, it doesn't, there's nothing inter, uh, integrate to the video or the topic of that article into the screen or the academic content or anything like that. Yep. How much motivation to do that? Can you say more about that? 
it's, it's not connected to anything that I have unmet. If I do a sort of knowledge, I'm not motivated in terms of creating or creating to, to go to the assignment. So it was just a direction by the lecture for me to go there. If I go there, it's fine. If I don't, it's fine. So it's just another source of knowledge that the teachers were contacting for me. Okay. Great point. Yeah. Is there um, some way to see students have pushed through? Yeah. Like, we have as well, we can tell what their progress is. Mm -hmm. I've heard there is. Like, I haven't seen, have, have you guys seen it? Which pages they clicked on? Okay. From my experience uh, last semester, you can tell which student has gone to the assignment. Where is it? You can tell. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. You can tell that they did go in it, but ah. <laughs> you don't know what well, they're doing. Yeah. 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 But if you then connect it to another low level grading or some assignment of some sort, then you know that they have the motivation that they did. Yeah, good point. It's like that's a good point. It's like there I don't see what's so motivating about having these links on here. And let's say you had to leave class early and you didn't hear me say at the last two minutes, oh, here's what you should do after class, or you weren't there. Um, or you forgot. It's like what what did she say we were supposed to do? So Canvas isn't helping me very much. Um, I might have a great idea about what we're going to talk about on Thursday because of this art, because of this video, which is very eye-catching. Um, but what do you think is really going to happen in class on Thursday when I come in and say, okay, what do you all think? What, what, what ideas did you get from the video and the article? Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 yeah. So I might have great ideas, but Canvas isn't helping me much here. It's really all it's doing is just the very mechanical things of providing the link, which is good at that. It's good at it's good at linking the video. It's good at linking the articles, but they're kind of bland when when you just do that. Any other comments? Uh, I I am super virgin with this, so I don't know if. Pantura is something that is like a UW thing or if any school using Canvas is going to be using that? Great question. Uh, I mean, I think Kaltura as a company serves many organizations, but we have our specific license with Kaltura. So when you log in with your NetID, um, that is our Kaltura hosting space. And you can set uh, privacy, you can set uh, like privacy limits on the video. It's like only I can see this or only people with net IDs can log in to see it. Mm -hmm. um, so we sometimes we call it YouTube for the UW, but it's not as open okay. as, as YouTube, but it just behaves like in a way that you put videos there and then people can watch them. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So if students were to post videos about projects they did, it would be like open as well. They, they can, yeah, the default setting is usually that it's private, and you have to change the setting to make it public uh, to more people. So we're taking you really well. That's that's really what I was trying to do. That the, the easiest thing for me to do in Canvas is to just stick links in there and say I'm done. Um, but as you really correctly crit you critiqued me really well that there's not it's not clear what students are supposed to do it's not motivating i don't necessarily know whether they've done it or not and i come to class on thursday expecting people to be talking about ideas and making connections and i don't get that so one thing i can try what, what's something i could try to do to try to make this a better experience to make the class more interactive and to make it more motivating and interesting for students. What what are some things I could do? Given that that's kind of my basic concept. Yes? You could make a, a, like a small assessment for our activities. Okay. I never know if that's like, <laughs> I'm sort of like that or if that's too deep, but you could do like a little 
Has anyone done the assignment? I mean, I hear, I mean, I know what I hear people say about the uh, small assessments, but I'd like to hear from more people. Have you used something like that? Like a little, like a little two-point quiz. Something like Seeing, seeing not this way and this way. <laughs> My students say they like them. Okay. But I did not look up the color. And then our last that we were going to have a But yeah, it's so small and point that mm -hmm. it's the thick or the thin that it's just going to be in there. Okay. We do our job right in. So it's like we call them self assessment. So just mm -hmm. kind of like a knowledge check for them. Some of our courses have them weekly, and then one of our courses has one at the beginning of the semester and one at the end of the semester, and it's actually the same assessment to kind of see, like to, for the students to see where they started from and what they've learned. Mm -hmm. And those ungraded surveys, or what is the stuff that you use? Yeah, yeah, individuality for the most part. Yeah, yeah Canvas, you can, do, you can do graded quizzes or ungraded quizzes. You, you can do surveys where you just get a point for participating in them. There's different varieties. If you want to see them, you can make a note of, of something to demo. I'll hand it out. You got your hand up. Um, I used to do something more in Canvas. So I gave them the question, and then they, they recorded themselves responding to that question. And that, um, those new vocabulary or new language structures that they learned pre uh, class content, they used to do those. So without that knowledge of um, new vocabulary and language structures or an event, they were unable to participate in the activity. And in, in class activity, the first thing I did was to make them play a game. So I developed some games using their platform, and then they would play. It didn't, it didn't add much to their, to their grade, but it motivated them. Because they will not play the game, they will not be involved in the activity. So oh. there was some some form of self 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 um, self initiated learning. If you did not do it, you will not learn. In the first few weeks, it was difficult, but as the semester progressed, there were still changes and in the in the I really like that. So you've got you know, so you've got some, there's some real motivation there. To, to do to do the activity, and also that uh, they're they're applying what they've learned right away, so they're they're getting into that doing. Let me give you an example. Um, um, in June, there's a certain way you teach an adult. There's a certain way you teach uh, an older person. So the activities in class is today we're going to um, the outcome of the lesson. Learn how to create different. Uh, groups in this, uh, different age groups in English. So the activity in class, all the interactive activities that you can uh, uh, help them learn how to do that. But they need the words in order to do that. So they need to know what you say, how to say woman in English. They need to know how to say a man in English, how to say friend. So they need those vocabulary in order to participate in class. Right. So what I did was all the time, whatever they were to learn in class, they had the vocabulary to say. Uh -huh. Nice. Oh, that's great. And, and I like that, that what they're doing in class is, is, so, is fun. Yes. So and if I haven't done my homework, I don't get to do the fun thing. And there's a teacher who can tell if the students have done their homework. Yep. Yep. That's, that's good, quick feedback. We're going to move on. Uh, so example one was kind of a throwaway. It's just like, I, I knew this was kind of lame. Um, example two, I'm trying to do better. So I've got my annotation back. That's not something students would see. But uh, so for students, here we have week three is animal food caching. And I have one page. So now I've embedded the video, but for us, here's just a little technical bit. Uh, in the first example, I linked to the video in Kaltura, and if you noticed, it had that other page came up with a new button, so I had to click another button, 
what I've done here is embedded the video into the page so I could put a little context around it, saying, here, watch this video because blah, blah, blah. So now you take, uh, just like we did before, just take a couple of minutes to look at my annotation. This is what I'm trying to do, uh, trying to get, get make that in-class, out-of-class flow more obvious and look at uh, my, my, my Canvas page of how I think now, hopefully, this page helps me help my students make meaning and come to class and be more active. How am I doing this different? And uh, what have I made better? Or what what's it still what's still unclear? Or what what do you see? before the text more video I want students to see. 
And I, I wonder if the, the decision to put them after is deliberate to get them to watch the video first and not be too influenced by what you're saying? Or um, I'm curious. Um, what I'm, I'm curious. What, what does anyone, what does anybody, anybody have thoughts on that? Putting the questions first or after, before or above or below the video? I'll tell you why I did it. I think you, there's a tendency or, or a p potential in scaffolding what you want them to think about. So start to think about it as a, <coughs> sorry, what's your Italian, French, French yeah. and Italian special uh, expert um, versus watch it as a casual watcher, you know. Right. Um, so if you want to start prompting them to start thinking about your discipline, seeing it through the lenses of your discipline, then that might be a way to do it at the beginning. Certainly at the beginning of their of the semester and maybe towards the end, let them do it on their own and then afterwards say, did you see the blah, 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 or did you think about these questions? Yeah. And in my case, I looked to the video and I thought, oh, you know what, I should really get some contextual questions. I'll, I'll type them in now. Uh, I guess I'm not a great, I'm not a great technology teacher. I can just, I can just like act as like a, Where you asked about what can you say about the style of writing in your scientific notational system, and you had some follow up questions. Some of those questions, at least for my students, I think would be hard to answer, and I think it's helpful to put a few examples of potential answers okay. so students who are feeling like unfamiliar with this kind of analysis have at least some choices to start with. That's a good point. It's like, it's like I can't, I can't assume my students know how to be critiquing articles, especially since this isn't really a, a writing class. But give, so giving examples, if I say, here is what I'm looking for, like it's starting to draw. I'm drawing some of those lines, of making the connections, and then helping give, showing students that here I've drawn some lines. Now you're going to draw some lines. You're going to be. their own summaries to be processing on their own mm -hmm. um, but I maybe my students aren't really ready to do that they might if I haven't given some examples of what I'm talking about uh, like Sarah was suggesting they might uh, do you think have I given the students enough to be doing this work so, so again my whole my whole plan is that they do they do part of this before the Tuesday class and so hopefully my page was clear about that. Um, uh, before class, 
up on Tuesday. Do this thing. And then on Tuesday, we have more discussion and we talk more about examples. I got some small group work. Um, do you think my students are, have I given my students enough to come to class on Tuesday to start talking about ideas about the, the badger digging? So what's really going to happen in class on Tuesday? So we start out with questions. I said, okay, so what questions do y'all have uh, about the badger digging example? That's how I start my Tuesday class. But what's going to happen? I think you have to make them accountable for those questions you ask at the end of the before Tuesday assignment. Right. And have a drop box. Okay, so my mo the motivation might not quite be there as much as, as I'd like it to. Right. In terms of connecting it to the content, oh. but I thought you said the students are supposed to sleep. Yeah. So I think this is a basic tip. Structure as well as the information you need to be able to address the Okay. Right. So. So it's a, let's say this is a class of about 80 people, and you can be kind of hidden if you wanted to. And let's say I, let's say somebody didn't read this article and they came to class on Tuesday. Did they participate in class? So am I gonna sneak it by, sneak it by without reading this? Probably. So that's something that my students learn is that hey, I don't really have to read this. Which I don't want them to learn. <laughs> <laughs> but if I come to class on Tuesday and I say, what questions do you have about the Badger video? And I get nothing. Oh, okay. Well, then y'all y'all read it. Let's let's go on and, and start discussing. And I'll I'll give my little lecture about more examples. So I'm not really. I'm doing, I'm trying to do more to help my students work on their own between class, uh, but I, I could still do better. Um, and I'll, I'll point out another technical thing I've done here is that this, uh, this article, I've linked, I've embedded the article. So my article is housed in uh, our box uh, file storage system. And then I can then control who has access to it. I have made it open, but I could have made it so you had to log in. And I made it easy, hopefully easy for students to get to that I put the little preview there. It's not just a link, it's like, hey, here's this article. You can click on it. And it opens up in the full screen here. So it's just a different way that Canvas can connect you to articles than you don't, you have other options in your group. All right, so my last example. Um, I'm gonna move on to example three. This is where I've tried to do more. I've tried to incorporate some of the ideas you were suggesting before. Example one. <coughs> So again, it takes a couple of minutes to look this over, what, what the plan I'm trying to do, how I'm trying to help students uh, both work, uh, uh, work on their own individually so that they come to class prepared and can do deeper stuff and also to make their own meaning.
I'm a bit more thoughtful. I've put more work into my, my plan. Put more work into what my students are doing in Canvas. And I've tried to design a path, a pathway. And if uh, we were looking at the example in Canvas, uh, students could see there's several links in the module. So hopefully the, the wings are meaningful. This should look familiar now. I'm introducing another paper about punishment. Okay. All right, and something uh, been mentioned before. I have a low stakes quiz. So what I could do, what I used to do in this class, but I changed it just for technical simplicity, is I could make my module structure really locked down. That it's like you cannot move forward to the next thing until you get a hundred on this quiz. So I could, I could. So Canvas will let you do that. It's like you can't do this until you've done that. Um, what I found is that if there's any technical glitch in an earlier page, you can't. Like you could be very, very well intentioned about doing the assignment, but you can't. So guess what happens when students are doing, trying to do this at two in the morning? You know, they get stuck. They email you. All right, so for so there's good and bad about that forced path. Uh, it's just good to be aware that it's an option to try to force students that they may to go through content and activities in a certain way. But then there's potential downsides if something if something glitches. You're stuck. So I made this quiz, and what I've done that's going to be hard to tell is that I've four three points or three questions. I actually wrote, I think, five questions. And then ran, have Candace randomly pull three of them. So if a student is taking it multiple times, they might not get the exact same question. But it's a very low stakes quiz, so I'm, I didn't write 20 questions. It's only a few. And it's a uh, low count. So, done that, uh, and it's just on basic facts of the reading. And then the next thing, and this is all before we come to class on Tuesday. And so now I've added this other, this other bit. So this is what they do before class on Tuesday. So how do you think uh, class on Tuesday is going to, how, how do you think this is going to go? Uh, how, how, are, how are they going to count the class on Tuesday? Huh? Well, just the, just, the, just the before Tuesday ones. We'll take it one day at a time. So I've given them the, art, the video and the article and another article uh, that I introduced them with. Um, a low stakes quiz on just basic facts. And now here's a chance to say something of, for one point, just submit a couple of lines about something you took away from the article. Do you think they'll do this? Okay. Are my instructions, how are my instructions?
know what they wrote. So I can go into Canvas in the speed grader really quick and just look at, and hopefully there are only one or two sentences, so I can just go through really fast and say, oh, a lot of people commented on X. And I can just sort of check through the grade book, look at the columns and see that the majority of people have taken the quiz um, or not. So when I come to class on Tuesday, I'm more prepared as well, that I know if students have done, it, have done this or not. And I have all these responses that, gee, a lot of people commented on, I didn't know badgers were that strong. So I can, so I'll have more to go on uh, that then I can come into class and say, wow, a lot of you commented on X, Y, Z. Let's talk about that more. Or a lot of you had questions about this. So hopefully the students are more prepared and I'm more prepared. How much more work do you think this took me? Um, then if I was really easy. So I made up five quiz questions and I made this really sort of general assignment. The hardest part was the quiz questions. Well, that's actually a lot of work. Okay, all right. <laughs> Same more. Every week you have to make five quiz questions. There's a lot of creation and stuff. That's true. Yeah. So once you have the name, it's just easy. Thank you, Terry. But then you have to keep going through all the assignments and checking them every single week as well. Um, yeah. and, and I know from my experience doing online classes, that takes a lot longer than any other assignment that we do at home. Okay. So there's another example of this very low stakes sort of low point value um, assignment to check under the module um, Apply Learning, Applying Learning Principles. And you can use the graded survey, graded survey to and it, you can even make it a graded anonymous survey just so that that you know that by answering a survey question whether it's right or wrong it's kind of like this assignment here just give me some reaction but you can prompt them to read this give me a reaction now and you get a point for it so it's not really coming up with specific quiz questions with right and wrong answers as much as give us some feedback so I know that you've done this and it's a very low stakes, low risk way to earn a few points before your class, which they'll all do, and then you can go through, just as Sid has said, um, and check out those survey answers uh, beforehand. They get a point for it, so it's a win situation for them. You get to see who did it and what their questions are, so it's a win situation for you, and it's pretty easy. Is there a way that when you do a survey question, you can get all the answers, or do you always have to do speed grader? One by one. Um, I believe it's speed grader one by one. If you want all the answers, then you're going to have to do a Google form, I think, or Qualtrics or something like that. So I have to make up like 250 students. Yep. So every time I do one of these things, I'm always like, I can't look at any. Right. <laughs> it's just like it's overwhelming, and speed grader is like so slow to go student by student, so it makes it so I never want to actually check in on these kinds of things. And there are strategies that uh, we've talked about in previous active teaching labs where faculty will say, you'll get graded students for answering three times this semester. I will check in on you. And on the first time, they give them feedback. The second time, they give them feedback. The third time, they don't give them feedback. That way the students don't know, is this my third week? Or is this, you know, can I stop doing it now? Um, they kind of keep them hanging on that third week. But that way, as an instructor, you only have to go through a certain number per week. Um, and that makes it easier for you. It's still gives you a spot check idea of whether people are doing it or not, but there are some fun strategies that kind of help you cheat on that. Right, so these are good points. If you're thinking about how you know, the overall flow of what the students are doing in class, out of class, some of it's your workload too, is how to create, what you're gonna create, uh, the, the investment in creating these things, and then also what you can do with them afterwards. If it's quiz questions, you might spend a lot of time writing the questions, but then Canvas can auto-grade them. And you can even plug some feedback into the questions. Oh, if you answered D, think about blah, blah, blah. Go refer back to page 42 in the text. But that's more work for you up front, but then once it's done, you can keep reusing it. And if it's a one-point quiz, uh, it's probably not worth a lot of students' effort to cheat, find ways to cheat. So you might be kind of safe on that. 
Whereas if you want to do something that may be more open-ended, like John was saying, like some kind of survey, so give me a reaction. Uh, it's easier, that's an easy question to write, but then what do you do with the responses? Um, and as Lori brought up in Canvas, you're stuck with speed grader, but there's other, other tools that might give you more of a spreadsheet. Yeah. So. The one solution I, I think with that is using Google Forms and then having a random number generator at the end so students submit the number into the survey and it's not really a random number it's it's the number and then it i have the same number in the survey if it's correct they get it automatically and then i get all of their responses in one wow which is very helpful when you have big groups of people yeah. that, that random number is very clever so they think it's a random number yeah then but you have to change it for each assignment okay to, to be that right that so it helps a lot that's very clever and so Google, people are interested in Google Forms, that's something we could demo uh, after this break. Um, so I think for my example, uh, and something else I've done here is, um, this is a technique that as I'm writing it, I could say, that might be good or that might not, that might be a lot of work. You know, who's familiar with the idea of the muddiest point, uh, muddiest point paper? Would you like to raise enough to say what it is? I think at least in the, the online class that I was in at UK, it was what is the most difficult point that you're struggling with, the most difficult concept, and so then you just share it with everyone. And oftentimes we can commiserate with people who also don't get that point, and then we just want to hear as feedback on what people are really struggling with. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. So in my idea, uh, where in class on Tuesday, I have people, okay, just take a minute and make a note for yourself. And then they come to Canvas and they submit their muddiest point and, uh, and something they talked about in their group. Lori, I did just do a check on that. Um, and you can download a student analysis CSV file that has all of their responses. Every three weeks. <laughs> We're always learning. <laughs> What's it called? The CSV? Yeah, download the student analysis CSV, so it's comma separated values, I think. Is the, so then you can put it into an Excel sheet or a uh, Google Sheets. So, as an instructional strategy, I'm trying to get all my students to reflect. Uh, kind of a, a structured, you get a point, two points for reflecting on. So hopefully that the my intent with that is that they're remember having to remember what they learned and do this tiny bit of application, just just thinking about their learning, thinking about what they what uh, how they're processing, and again this is information that I'm collecting online, so I can review it and work with it before class the next time. Summarizing an article, giving them choice. Something I'm trying to do here in my strategy is I want students to be putting, <coughs> looking at. I want them to say, "Hey, these are these are articles I picked for you. These aren't just the things, the random things off the internet." And I'm trying to give them choice, so it's not just one article. It's like, well, I pick some, I pick some topics. Uh, you don't have to go find the article. Here are three or four to choose from, and hopefully something here is interesting to you. So that's something I'm trying to do to give students a little more agency, a little more ownership, is you pick what's interesting. But it's not so wide open that I'm going to get articles from anywhere. Uh, so when I grade these, hopefully they're a little more contained, that I know what sort of things happened in these four articles. That's part of my instructional strategy is to help students have some agency and ownership by being able to make a choice, but still yet be constrained in their choice. And again, at the end of the module, we're working uh, 
so with having an article and having some complaints about summarizing it. So how do you how how is my instructional strategy now? What would what would you make better about it? About either my strategy or how I've done it and how I've portrayed it in Canvas. simpler you know, to, and I started doing that on pages I haven't published because I didn't finish them it's like here's the things to do before Tuesday here's the things to do before Thursday and break them up more instead of being all this click next 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 um, so that's what I would do if I were to do one more thing I would try to make my navigation a little cleaner than this long list of, of lists in the module and keep in mind that the students have the to-do list that shows up on their view. Uh, and so what the danger is that they might actually go click on the assignments without going through and doing the content, reading through the content that's necessary to complete the assignments. So they'll click on the assignment and they'll think, oh, let's see if I actually need to do the reading for this or if I can just finish the assignment without doing any of the reading. So you might get a lot of, yeah, I think I know enough without having to go through the content. Um, and there's actually no way that I'm aware of to disable that to-do list or to hide the content, which is some of our instructors' um, strategies or has been in the past in Moodle and D2L. Even though there's pros and cons to any approach. Yep. So, um, so we're going to take a five-minute break. And during the break, I'm going to check out and see if anybody's requested something to demo. Uh, and we can do live demos of anything in Canvas you want to see that, ho that hopefully I know how to do. Um, and we have, on the front page of your handout was 10 ideas for ways Canvas can facilitate individual learning. So we can do, we can demo any of this or any Canvas questions you have. Uh, hopefully, and if you put in the context of how students would work with it, that's helpful. But really, I'm open to demoing uh, most anything. So we'll come back at 20 after, and I'll check out and see if uh, what you what you'd like to see. And we have plenty of coffee and bagels left. Need your help on 
with Google. I got a mega form. Okay. But the integration. Mostly I link to them. I don't. I have embedded them. I've done it. I have one. It just might be embarrassing to watch me do it. I'd be happy and to. Rem and remember how to do it. Happy to jump in. Okay. Plug in, right. plug in number four and I'll run through it. Okay. Canvas? 
Talk about the badgers. Talk about badgers. Burying cows. Yeah, I know. Um, 
Womp, womp, womp. You win. <laughs> so it showed up, but then when I refreshed it, it unless somebody deleted it by accident, which is okay. Did you save it before you? I saved it, and it showed up on there where it said Lori is here, Sarah Jean, hello, and then I wrote Lindsay is here, save it, and then when I refreshed, it disappeared. Wow. Interesting. Yeah, I might wonder if there's. I, I don't know the intricacies of how Canvas is treating multiple people working at the same time. Right, since it's not like Google. Yeah, the answer is very badly. It does not Apparently. work. You know, Google <laughs> works very well with that. Multiple people working at the same time, it keeps track of that. Canvas does not. As you just experienced, sure. if somebody else saved something, even though it looks like it's saved on yours, mm -hmm. if they saved it beforehand and then you just refreshed in that time, yours is gone. So this is a great tool for very small groups working on individual things that you want in Canvas. But really, Google's a better tool. And you can embed a Google, Google Doc in here, let that group get in there and take care of it all. Right. So this is an example. So I, in this case, I linked to a Google Doc. And you all can edit it. Uh, I could probably go back into the history. And you didn't have to hit save. Uh, you can work in there multiple amount. Multiple people can be editing at the same time. You can see it show up. And uh, John said this could be embedded in a Canvas page. And he's not fast about that. Um, so what? It takes another step. That you do have to go to Google and you have to make the page and you have to determine the sharing and privacy settings. Uh, so this page, I set it so that anyone could, anybody who has this link, can edit it. You all didn't have to log in with your net ID. Um, so that's some of, the, some of the ways I did that. But so this is a, it's another tool if you have people making collective content. And in some ways, I think this is easier than the, than the Canvas wiki because it just behaves in ways that are more predictable. Um, you can track who did it. You can control access a little uh, the way you want it to. Any other thought? Any other thoughts on uh, using a Google page or a wiki page for creating content for students working together? I imagine Google would also be better in the sense that you have back pages, so if someone deletes a whole bunch of stuff, you can go back and get it. Um, not to say that students would sabotage each other, but if they do the back page, I think the Google page is better for that. For more students to back page. Yeah. And I actually did have an, a, a case where students did sabotage each other or the sign-up sheet. Two guys wanted to sign up and present right next to each other, so they deleted somebody else. But they didn't know about the revision history, apparently, so <laughs> it was kind of a problem for them. Yeah. Um, and now they know. Yeah. And there's a lot, a lot of benefits to, to the tool, this is both for individual learning and collaboration, that I can contribute on my own time out of class, and it's not solely restricted to, I, I can't, I'm not necessarily the only one who can do it, so I can come back and see if, how someone's uh, picked up on my ideas, um, taken them further. So depending on the kind of instruction you give students of how to use this, you could get kind of brain dump. Uh, you could get collaborative editing and trying to summarize and synthesize ideas. So it's just, it's just a tool. And the other, uh, another item, link to the website. So embedding, okay. Embedding this, so we'll go in order. Um, so we've also had some uh, requests for Google Forms. And John is much better at Google Forms than I am. So I'm going to turn it over to him and pod four. So I'll change the projector input to pod four. And then do the table monitor. So what we'll do real quick is we'll create this Google Form that's embedded within this page. And this is 
um, from the session that I taught last week. So there's my Google form. You can go through. Anybody can sign up for it or click into it and um, access it. And the way to do that is very simple. I've got the Google form up here, in the last tab up here. So just I've created the Google form here. And when I want to share it, I click on the send button. I've got different, I can email it. I can get the link for it. I'm going to do the third thing here, which is grab that. That's an iconic view of, of embed. I'm going to grab that HTML for the embed. I can change the width here and the height here if I want to. Um, oftentimes when you embed, Canvas will default embed 150 pixels tall and 300 pixels wide for some reason. That's too small for anyone to do anything with. So I don't know why they have that, but I want to grab this one. It's already set up in the code here. So it's, it's a very simple um, task to do. I'm going to grab a copy. Go back to my Canvas course. Click on Edit. Before I go to click on Edit, I'm going to look for this part right here. Here's the survey. I want to put it right below this. So now I'm going to go to Edit. And I'm going to enter the very, very, so here's the rich text editor that I'm in right now. And here's where I want to put it. I'm going to click into the HTML editor, which is up here at the top here. And you can see that it looks much more scary, but still you can parse through it if you've done any sort of um, spy work as a fifth grader. So here's the survey. I found that. And this iframe below is the text that I'm going to put in. And this is the old one. Ah, close up dictionary. So this is what it would look like without any and without any um, embed here. So right here, I'll go in and I'll paste that. And so there is the same information that I just grabbed from here. And you can see right here, I've got the 760 width and the 500 height. I can change that to a 100%. Hit save. And there we are, 100% wide. And again, as Sid mentioned, this is pretty important, I think. Under settings, do make sure that this box is not checked for the restrict to UW-Madison. Even though everybody on campus has a wisc.edu Google account, not everybody prefers it. So they are very likely logged in with their personal email account or their personal Gmail account, their Google account, and they might prefer to use their own. Save yourself a bunch of frustrated emails trying to explain to students, no, you have to log in with your wisc.edu address in here. Just leave it open. It's protected already because the students have to log into your Canvas course. So you don't have to worry about this getting out to the world. Granted, the students can say, you know, share this with all their friends, post it on Facebook or whatever. And you might get a thousand people doing that, but it's it's a slim risk. Yeah. Um, how do you, how do you how do you edit a question? How do you create a Google form in the first place oh. and add a question? These are all good <laughs> questions. I'm going to go to forms.google.com. You see that I'm logged in with my personal account here. Just to keep things separate, I'm going to log in with my WISC account. So here I am with my WISC.edu account. I'm going to create a new form. And then it's just a matter of adding questions with a little plus sign on the side. Um, question one can be a multiple choice. It can be a short answer, a paragraph, checkboxes, drop down, 
Um, you can have them do file uploads. Now, interesting thing about the file uploads, they cannot do file uploads unless you have a, they log in with their wisp.edu account. So if you want them to upload a file this way, then you have to have them all log in with a WISC account. And Google does this so that people don't spam you with uploading, I don't know, pornography or whatever into your thing. There's a, a way to document and track who does stuff. So file uploads only work with the WISC.edu thing. Linear scale, multiple choice, checkbox, etc. Let me just quick check this. I click this off. I believe file upload goes away. No, it does not. Oh, but they will be required to sign into Google. So, okay, that's cool. And then anytime you can copy these questions, you can click back on it and you can change and edit that way. Any other questions about Google Forms? Over here? Do you, have a, do you have any examples of the responses and how they're shown? Um, my gosh, I do. And you don't have to do anything special to have Google give you the responses. They just get, they just get correlated. It seems easier than Caltrex. Oh, it's so much easier than Caltrex. Oh, yes. It doesn't have as much many options. <clears throat> So if you're a hard, if you're a serious, I mean, if you're doing research where you need like really specific responses and analysis capabilities, Qualtrics is doing more. But if you want just a quick survey, just getting some responses from your students in the way that's easy to do, Google is much easier. Mm -hmm. So you don't have as many question choices uh, as you would in Qualtrics. Do you have branches? You can do branching, yes. Oh. I found branching to be a little clunky in Google. Although it's clunky in Qualtrics as well. Yeah. Okay. All right, so we're in the questions tab right now. I can click on responses, and this is one of my favorite things. Um, I did have people collect their email on this one, even though it wasn't necessarily whisk.edu. Google does a very quick um, automatic creation of tables and graphs and stuff. You do not have a choice, um, so there, you know, there's a, a negative aspect to this. In Qualtrics, you can choose what kind you want and create the graphs. In Google, you do not, but it sort of picks the best one that it thinks. Um, so you get a bunch of different information about all kinds of stuff. Probably don't want to have too, uh, too complicated questions, otherwise you end up with a graph like this. My bad. Um, individual goals, getting back to what I think Lori was asking about earlier individual questions. You can very quickly go through and scan through these to see what people want, um, etc. So it's a quick, quick way to see a lot of data pretty quickly. And then you can go check on the uh, the Google Sheet of this as well by clicking on this little green guy up at the top. And it'll create a new spreadsheet for you in Google Sheets. And that's where you can get in and you can start creating your own um, your own graphs if you want a better graph than the uh, pie chart default or whatever. Here you can use all of Google's individual. Um, or export it to Excel. Or export it to Excel and use Excel's charts and things like that. So. That's what I have to share. All right, thank you. Let's see those demos. Uh, also, uh, interest in surveys. Uh, any Google Forms and surveys or or the Canvas surveys. a little confusing in Canvas because a survey is filed as a quiz. Um, so first of all, you have to make a quiz. Find your new quiz. And then at the bottom of my 
So I now want to edit it. The default is that declares is a graded quiz, but I can change that to be either a graded or an ungraded survey. So a graded survey, let's say you just get a point for taking the survey. Um, make it worth a point, and most of the settings are still the same. I can give it an opening date. I can give a closing date. Um, I can define it to group. And then a survey is much like a quiz. I can add questions. To me, the graded survey is one of the best tools in Canvas. You could not, in D2L, do an anonymous graded survey. If you want to get student feedback, set up an anonymous graded survey here. They get grade, a little point grade for, or whatever you want. You can make it a high stakes survey if you want. Um, but they get a grade for filling out the survey, but you do not get to see who they are. And so they will feel more confident giving you honest feedback instead of saying, oh, I better be careful what I say, so I'm going to say all really good things, and then you don't actually have good feedback about your course. And is it um, clumped the uh, responses by question or by user? Again, it's the same speed grader type thing as you would have in quizzes, and to see them all together, you'd have to um, do the CSV export. Yeah. Okay, so there's that option. Yeah. Okay. It was really easy to make, so I just uh, made an essay question to be an open-ended, what do you think about badgers? Um, then I save and publish. So now if I become the test student, this is a really useful thing to know about. If you aren't using test students, I highly recommend it. You go to settings, uh, there's the student view. And it's not 100% the same as what students see, but it's like 98 uh, so what, and as uh, test students, you can take quizzes, you can upload assignments, and then as an instructor, you can also grade the test student assignments, and then you can log in as test student again, you can see how the grade appears, how the notice appears. Um, so test student is a really good thing to know about. So I'm test student now, and I'm going to take my more badgers quiz, survey, and then student says take the survey. I might not have saved my question. I think that was good. So, so another good reason to be test student is good. So if something isn't published or something wasn't saved, test students will find out. And now I'm back to the instructor. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't save my question. I didn't have test student and I wasn't using test student, I wouldn't have done that. So surveys, surveys are ungraded surveys are a tool available to use. They've got different the question types are the same sort of question types as quizzes, but they, they work differently. So here's one about links to websites and embedding into modules and pages. Linking to a website is really 3D. Uh, embedding a website in a page is something of, uh, I want to think about why you want to do that. And the process would be really similar to what John showed for uh, embedding the Google form that you can embed a web page within a Canvas page. Uh, someone was asking me this last week, and I said, well, you, 
can do that, you have to, you know, will require going into HTML code and knowing how to do the embed code. And then your web page will be constrained within the Canvas page. So it might be a different user experience. Um, but this is a straight link to a web page. And again, I go to modules and I add a thing. I'm adding an external URL. This afternoon, we've got a managing grades session from one to two. Looks like uh, tomorrow morning, tips and tricks in Canvas from nine to ten. It's the same room. Well, coffee and bagels again. This afternoon, we have iced tea and cookies. I think tomorrow afternoon, file management in Canvas. Um, this is a good session on learning how to title things, basically, so that it's not confusing for you and not confusing for your students. Friday morning, we have um, an active teaching lab, our first active teaching lab of the semester, sort of a preview of what's available. Again, learning science shows that the more um, distributed your learning is, the more deeply you learn. So you can't cram stuff. Cramming doesn't work. Throughout the semester, we have these active teaching labs. We learn something every week. We you get a lot of things that are reinforced that you'll be like, oh, I heard of that before, but now it's a, in a different context, slightly different, but more reinforced. We're going to have our first one on uh, Friday morning. And then Friday afternoon, another tips and tricks session um, in Canvas, so that's cool. And we have this room scheduled all day, so if anybody wants to hang out after the session and work on, work on something or just or ask us more questions if you want to go into something a little more in depth then you could do this quickly on the fly. Um, so before you go, uh, we've given you a little half sheet for feedback, or the whole sheet, sorry. Um, so please fill this out. Uh, let us know how we're doing, what you'd like to see, because uh, we take this, we work with this data and, uh, and help inform what we keep doing with this new program.